Good morning, my dear students. We are almost at the end of your paper, CC213, students of fourth semester. How does it feel? You finished most of your lectures and now you can look forward to your revision of all the papers that you have been listening to all these days. Remember, in an earlier lecture, you must have looked at some of the figures of speech. I am talking about unit 4 of the paper literary criticism, paper 213, CC 213. Can we have a quick review of the figures of speech that you have already learnt? Remember, you looked at irony last time. You looked at two opposites, litotes and hyperbole. Remember what you learnt in that lecture? You talked about understatement and overstatement. And then you went on to look at climax and anticlimax. Going on in the process of trying to understand the figures of speech, today we are going to look at some more. Some figures of speech, my dear students, have got to do with words and their meaning. And some figures of speech have got something to do with words and their sound. Because when you hear a sound, when you hear a word, there is a meaning that you associate with it. There is a spelling that you associate with it, but there is also a sound that you associate with it. So today, first I shall be talking about two figures of speech which have got something to do with the meaning. And then I shall go on to talking about two more figures of speech which have got to do something with their sound. And as I come to them, I shall give you also examples from everyday life. So, shall we begin with the first figure of speech? The first figure of speech that we are looking at today, my dear students, is metonymy. Where does it come from? So many of our words in the English language today, particularly what I shall call technical words, words which are related to criticism, words which are related to appreciation, words, terminology which we associate with language and literature. So many of them, my dear students, have come from Greek and Latin because those were the two ancient languages of Europe. Just like in our country, many of our languages can trace their origin back to Sanskrit. So also, English has to go back to the European ancient languages. And when I talk about ancient languages, naturally, I am talking of Latin and then Greek. So, many of the words we use in modern English have come from Greek or Latin. So, let us look at the word metonymy. Look at your slide, my dear students. Metonymy comes from the Greek word, a change of name from meta and onymia, which means beyond the name. What is it? That is the origin of the word. Do you know the word, my dear students, for the study of origin of words? Maybe you have come across it, maybe some of you know the word. The word that we use is etymology, E-T-Y-M-O-L-O-G-Y. What is etymology? You know what is biology and zoology and psychology. And what is etymology? The study of the origin of words. So when you look at the word metonymy, you know where it's come from. You know that it's come from two words which means beyond or after and name. What is metonymy? It is a figure of speech in which a thing or concept is called not by its own name, but rather by the name of something associated in meaning with that thing or concept. What are the key words here? You have a word, but you are not calling it by that word, but instead by a word which is associated in meaning with that thing. I have here for you two very simple examples. Let me begin with the second example, because I think it will be clearer to you. When your teacher tells you, I have read Milton, does it mean that he has read Milton the man? Does it mean that he has read the body of Milton? No. 
all of us know it is very clear that when he says I have read Milton, he means I have read the works of Milton. And when someone says the crown is in danger, it does not mean that the crown is shaking, you know the crown, the mukut. it does not mean that that is shaking, it means that the king is in danger. So, what are we talking about? Not using the word, but using instead a word which is associated in meaning. So, we have Milton when we are talking about the works of Milton, you have crown when you are talking about the king. Let us understand it a little more. It is a word or phrase used in place of another with which it is closely associated. You must be using it, it is so often in your language. For example, when we say black coat, black cloak, we are talking about the lawyer. When we say stethoscope, what are we talking about? We are talking about the doctor. So, very often we do not use the word itself, but we use a word associated with it. This gives us a clear idea of what we are talking about. For example, when you say the law, very often you are talking about the policeman probably, when you say the law will take action, what we really mean is probably the policeman and so on and so forth. Look at your slide again, what are we doing? We are using a rhetorical strategy of describing something indirectly by referring to things around it, as in describing someone's clothing to characterize the individual. I gave you the examples and now I am making the point, so I think it is very clear. When I say black coat, you know I am talking about the lawyer, when I say stethoscope, you know I am talking about the doctor. So, what are we doing? Describing someone's clothing to characterize the individual. We do it very often, it is a, it's a rhetorical way, it is a way of speaking, because remember literature does not mean just saying things, it also means saying things beautifully, artistically, aesthetically and it is in order to do these that writers need to use figures of speech. Many of us, I repeat, use it in our everyday language also and such people are more interesting to listen to, because when you, when you listen to them, you find them speaking in a way which makes the effect far better than it would have been if they had directly stated something. Let us go on to the next slide and understand this figure of speech better. How are, how are we going to do it? By looking at examples. So, let us look at the example first. In a corner, a cluster of lab coats made lunch plans, right? Lab coats. So, you have the, the coats are not making plans, but it is the lab assistants, those who are working in the laboratory. They are all wearing those white coats, you know, so they could be interns, they could be somebody in the medical profession, they could be medical students. They are all in the lab laboratory, in the lab, Prayogshala, and they are talking about where to go for lunch today. So, what are they doing? They are talking. Who is talking? When you first read the sentence, it would seem as if the lab coats are talking, but we know that this is an example of a metonymy. So, what is it? We use the word lab coat instead of talking, instead of saying lab assistants or medical uh, students or interns or whatever. This can be done in different ways. The first one, when the thing contains another, it can frequently be used metonymically, as when dish is used to refer not to the plate, but to the food it contains, right. So, when I say I loved this dish, I have gone to eat, I am in a hotel, I am eating Chinese, Punjabi, whatever you want to eat my dear students and I say I loved this dish. Now, do I mean I loved the plate? Do I mean the dish, the bowl in which it was kept? Certainly not. I mean what is inside it. So, what am I talking to? Uh, what am I talking about? I am talking about the chole probably, which was kept in that dish. I say I love this dish. So, what am I doing? I am using the container instead of the contained. This is an example of metonymy. Metonymy where you refer to the container 
instead of talking. This jar has my favorite uh, sweet, suppose I say, and it is filled with biscuits, it is filled with cookies and I say I love this jar. What am I talking about? The container when actually what I am referring to is the contained, I hope you understand. The container jema muke luche and the contained shu mukyu che in our under. So, please remember this is one kind of metonymy which we use in everyday life. Look at the next one my dear students, look at the slide again. Or as when the name of a building is used to refer to the entity it contains as when the white house, when we say the white house is worried, it does not mean the white house is worried. We are talking about the, when we say Rashtrapati Bhavan, right, has a problem. It does not mean that the house has a problem, but it means who is there, the president, the US president when we talk about the white house and the Indian president when we talk about Rashtrapati Bhavan. Can you understand the point? These are different ways in which instead of saying the president, we say Rashtrapati Bhavan, instead of saying Chole, we say the dish, instead of saying biscuits or cookies, I say the jar, what are we doing? We are not referring to, we are talking about, we are using the word the outside, but what we are really talking about, what is in it. Sometimes we can use it for a tool or instrument. Often a tool is used to signify the job it does or the person who uses the job as in the phrase press when we really mean the printing press or as in the proverb the pen is mightier than the sword. What does it mean a writer is stronger than a soldier? Do you understand that? What is the pen? The pen is the tool that the writer uses. Today you might say, oh he uses the computer, does not matter. But what we are really saying is a tool. Remember this is a very old problem and therefore we say the pen is mightier than the sword. The sword, the soldier. So what you cannot defeat using a, a gun, a sword, uh, you can do by the power of the word. And what is the power of the word? the writer. So, the writer can succeed where the soldier fails, but what do we say? The pen is mightier than the sword. You understand that? This is also an example of metonymy. Let me repeat, when I talked about the dish, I was talking about the container. When I talk about the pen, I am actually talking about the writer. Let us go on and look at some more examples of metonymy. Product for process. This is a type of metonymy where the product or the activity stands for the activity itself. For example, when I say the book is moving right along, the book here refers to the process of writing or publishing. Understand that? We are using the product when we really mean the activity. What does it mean? I have finished writing the book, I have given it to my publisher, the publisher is going to probably edit it the publisher is probably going to print it, he is going to proofread it, all this is the process. And I say the book is moving along. My dear students, do not imagine that somebody has put the book somewhere and it is walking along, right? That would be a funny situation. But in the use of metonymy, what do we mean? We are referring to the thing when actually what we are talking about is the activity, the activity of writing or publishing. Another way in which we use metonymy is Punctuation marks often stand metonymically for a meaning expressed by the punctuation mark. I have an example for you. He is a big question mark to me indicates that something is unknown. You know the question mark, Chinha, right? The question mark. So, when I put a question mark at the end and I say what is your name, it means that I do not know your name, right? So, the question mark indicates, you know, when I put this question mark, it indicates that something is unknown to me. So, when I say he is a big question mark, what am I saying? I do not really understand him, I do not know him. What kind of a person is he? What are his qualities? What are his vices? What are his virtues? I do not know anything at all and therefore, I say he is a question mark. So, a punctuation mark can be used to say something metonomically. 
It's tough, my dear students, but I hope you have understood it because I have to go on to the next figure of speech, which is Sinak Ducky. Different, difficult pronunciation. But let's learn it. Let's learn the spelling and then let's learn what it means. Sinak Ducky. Ducky, the E is pronounced there, though sometimes it's not pronounced. When you were looking at hyperbole, you probably saw that hyperbole or hyperbole. But in Sinak Ducky, we have no choice. We have to say Sinak Ducky. What is Sinak Ducky? A part of something is often used for the whole as when people refer to head or assistants are referred to as hands. 100 sails for 100 ships. A little difficult, but let us try and understand it better. A part of something is often used for the whole as when people refer to head of cattle or assistants are referred to as hands, 100 sails for 100 ships, etc. What are we saying? When I say India won the match, does it mean the whole country went to play? No, it means the Indian team. Do you understand that? When I say India won the match, what am I saying? Not that the whole country went to play the cricket match or the football match or whatever or the hockey match, but the Indian team which represented India won. So what is it? A part of something. Also, the whole of something is used for a part as when people refer to a municipal employee as the council or police officers as the law. The example that I gave you that I gave you is for the second one. The example for the first one is hands raised proved that they were for the point. Hands raised. I have raised my hand. It does not mean my hand is saying yes. It means I am saying yes. Do you get the point? So when I say hands raised show that they agree, what I really mean is all those people agree. So you have one example where hand refers to people, right? or when you have India and it is actually referring to the Indian team. So shall I put it this way my dear students to make it clearer to you? A part for the whole or the whole for the part, right? So it could be a part for the whole or the whole for the part. We use India when we actually mean the Indian team, okay? And we use a part that is we use the hands raised when we actually mean the people. So what are we talking about? We are talking about Sinak Ducky. Do not confuse it with metaphor. It is different. Metaphor you had container, contained, you had question mark, etc. You had the president, the Rashtrapati Bhavan, etc. But now we are talking about Sinak Ducky. Let us look at the next slide. It comes from the Greek Sinak Ducky, which means simultaneous understanding. It is a figure of speech in which a term for a part of something refers to the whole of something or vice versa. I am saying that again because I want you to understand. And what does vice versa mean? Part of something refers to the whole, the whole refers to the part. Understand that when I say vice versa, it means you can put the opposite. So a part refers to the whole or a whole refers to the part. It has been defined as and please see that there are a number of comparisons, number of words, part of the whole, whole for the part, container for the contained, sign for the signified, material for the thing made, cause for effect, effect for the cause, genus for species, species for the genus. Difficult my dear students, but let us look at it again. Whatever is difficult is more challenging. And if you put more challenge, I am sure we understand it better. Greater effort, but you will understand it better. So let us look at it again. And of course, I am going to give you examples. And as I put the examples in front of you, it will become clearer. Do not worry. Part of the whole and whole for the part, we have already talked about. Container for the contained, we have already talked about. Material for the thing made, we have already talked about. The, the book, for example, the pen, for example, could refer. Cause for effect, effect for cause, genus for species and species for the genus. I am going to give you examples so that it becomes clearer. Do not worry, it will be clear if you pay attention and try to understand the examples. At first stroke, the Sinak seems very confusing, 
but once you understand it, I think it is very interesting. A part referring to the whole. Referring to people according to a single characteristic, for example, the grey beard represents an older man. I am sure in Gujarati you can immediately think of the word that we use. Of course, we talk of grey hair in Gujarati when we talk of an old man, but this is an English example. Or when we talk of long hair, we are talking about the hippie. Okay? So, we have got words in synecdoche where you refer to a part when you are actually talking about the whole. So, when I talk about the grey beard, imagine that there are some youngsters and some old people sitting and I say the grey beard nodded. My dear students, I do not want you to imagine that only the grey beard, only the beard nodded. What it really means is that the old man nodded. Just imagine the scene, there is somebody sitting with a long grey beard, you know, if you can think of Aurobindo or Rabindra Tagore, you know, they all had that long beard. So, somebody is sitting with a old, with a long grey beard and I say grey beard nodded, you will have a great deal of imagination to think that only the beard nodded. No, it is the old man who nodded, right. When I say the head nodded, it does not mean the head nods, when the head nods, it means I am saying yes or no depending on how I am nodding. So, you have a part when you are actually referring to the whole. Let us look at the slide again for the next example. Describing a complete vehicle as wheels or a motorcycle as handlebars. That is clear? A general class name used to denote a specific member of that or an associated class. For example, when in England or maybe all over the world, they talk about the good book or the book what they mean is the Bible. When they say truck, what they really mean is any four wheeled vehicle. I think some of you might remember, you use certain words to refer for example, Xerox does not mean Xerox, it actually means that you know the machine, the company which manufactures the Xerox machine. I remember in my childhood, we talked about Cadbury's to refer to any chocolate, we talked about Godrej to refer to any steel Almira. So, sometimes we are referring to something in particular when actually we are referring to the entire species, right? I talked about genus for species and species for genus. The words might be difficult, but I think it would be clear. The material that a thing is actually made of or referring to that thing, a little difficult, but please pay attention. What is it made of? So, we talk about that metal when actually we are talking of the thing. For example, in English, when we say brass, right, we are talking about brass instruments because we need brass, the section. When we talk about cement, we are actually talking about concrete and cement is one of the things that one of the materials that goes into the making of the concrete. We can also use the container to refer to the contents. I am giving you more examples. I gave you earlier examples about the biscuit and the jar. I gave you example about the chole and the dish, some more com examples. Barrel for a barrel of oil, keg for a keg of beer. He, when you say he drank the cup, you can't drink the cup, you do not put the cup into your mouth, right? So, when I say he drank the cup, what do I actually mean? He drank the contents of the cup. So, you have a tea cup and you are very, very hungry, thirsty. So, you drink everything that is in the cup and I say he finished the cup, he drank the whole cup. It could be a bottle of cold drink, right? a bot bottle of fruit juice and when I say he drank the whole bottle, I do not mean he drank the bottle, you cannot put the bottle into your mouth, it cannot go down your throat. Please do not try to do that, it can be dangerous. But what are we saying? the entire fruit juice or cold drink or whatever it is that you love, you put your head up like that and you finished, you gulped it all and then I say he drank the whole bottle. It is an example of synecdoche because actually I am talking of what is contained within the bottle, the tea in the cup and I say he emptied the cup, he drank the whole cup. I hope you understand that my dear students, all these are examples of synecdoche. Synecdoche, you do use in everyday language, but I am giving you different kinds, different ways in which the synecdoche is used in literature. 
for effect of course, because everything that is used in literature is for effect. I began by telling you my dear students that we will be looking at figures of speech where the sound is important. The first two that I looked at it was where the meaning was important, where what you were conveying is important, but what I am looking at now is where the sound is important. When I talk to you about the buzz of a bee, when I say the buzz of a bee, what comes to your mind? I just have to say buzz and immediately you think of a madhumaki, a bhamro. When I say hiss, you immediately think of a snake and somebody might talk about the clanking of bells, somebody might be talking about the swishing of lake, silk. Think of it in Gujarati, it sounds very be beautiful when we say kankan and a chanchan, it sounds beautiful. What are these? These are examples of onomatopoeia. Maybe you have come across this word too, onomatopoeia, where the sound of the word conveys the meaning of the word. All the words that I now used, buzz and hiss and clanking and tinkling, so also the chanchan or the kankan you can imagine that is onomatopoeia. You have come across the word even earlier in your earlier semesters, but today I am going to talk about two more figures of speech. Another figure of speech which has great relevance to sound, which is directly related to sound my dear students is alliteration, where the same sound is repeated. Sometimes they can become tongue twisters as in she sells seashells on the seashore. You have got sir and sure, sir and sure repeated. That is an example of a, of a tongue twister, but it is also an example of alliteration. But today I am going to talk about two new figures of speech. Please pay attention. In order to understand that better, I gave you examples of figures of speech related to sound that you already know. And that is why I spoke about onomatopoeia and alliteration because I believe if you understood those two figures of speech, you will now be able to understand what I am saying now. The first one that we are talking about my dear students, look at the slide is assonance. The first one is assonance. The repetition of identical or similar vowel sounds in neighboring words. Vowel sounds, my dear students, I am not talking of vowels. When we talk about vowels, you will talk about A, E, I, O, U. But when I am talking about assonance, I am talking about vowel sounds. Because if I am talking about the letter I, I might have a problem in a word like like and in a word like milk. Because the same letter I is E somewhere and I somewhere. In milk, it is E and in like it is I. So, I am not talking about the vowels, but I am talking about the vowel sounds. As we go along, I am sure it will become clearer. I only want you to pay attention to the sounds that I will be saying. And it would be interesting with your teacher's permission, if you repeat some of those sounds, because then you will know what exactly I am talking about when I am trying to describe, define and explain what is meant by assonance. We are talking about the same vowel sounds and therefore, if you look at sound E, it does not matter whether you are having P's, E, E, A, P, I, E, does not matter. I can have K, K, E, Y, I can have people, E, O, because I am not interested in the spelling here. I am talking about the same vowel sound. I want you to understand that in the English language, not always is the letter with the same sound. The same sound has different letters, the same letter has different sounds and that is what makes English such a difficult language and if you are in a happy mood you could even say it is a funny language, but we have to learn it, we have no choice and therefore let us go on and see what assonance is all about. Look at the slide again my dear students, what is assonance? The repetition of identical or similar vowel sounds in neighboring, neighboring words, where does it come from? From the Latin sound. It is the agreement in the vowel sounds of two or more words 
when the consonant sounds preceding and following these vowels do not agree. Thus strike and grind, hat and man rhyme with each other according to the laws of assonance. Please look at the slide very carefully in order to understand what assonance is. Because when you hear the word strike and grind, we are not looking at the, we are not listening to the consonants. We are listening only to the vowel sound. So, what is the vowel sound you hear my dear students? In strike and grind, the vowel sound that you hear is I. In hat and man, what is the vowel sound that you hear? It is a. When we generally talk about the rhyming, we talk about antyanupras and when we talk about antyanupras, we are looking at the end of the word, but this is a different kind of rhyme. We are talking of rhyming within the word and within the word, you have got consonants on both sides my dear students and you have got some vowel sounds in between. What we are doing is we are looking at the vowel sounds, please understand. According to assonance, the consonants are not important. In this rule, we are talking about rhyme, but we are talking about what is called an internal rhyme. And this internal rhyme refers to the rhyming within the word. So, how can you say strike and grind are rhyming ma'am? You could well ask me. And my answer, my explanation which I want you to listen to carefully and understand clearly is that we are looking at only the vowel sound. And what is the vowel sound my dear students in strike and grind? The vowel sound is I. You can think of many more sounds, you can think of like, you can think of might, everywhere you have got I. You can think of bike, you can think of fine, do you get that? The sound that we are talking about in assonance here is the vowel sound. Let us go on to man, I can have man and I can have bat. The mer and the no and the ber and the ter are not rhyming, but what is rhyming? The a eh is rhyming. This is assonance, where the vowel sounds rhyme with each other. What does that mean? The vowel sounds are the same. And where are they the same? Within different words, but the words have to come along with each other. That is, they should be in the same line, not at the end of lines as you would see if you look at a rhyming example of a rhyme generally in poetry, which in Gujarati we call antyanupras. This is not antyanupras, because the pras is happening not at the ant, not at the end, but within the word. Look at your slide again my dear students. So, what is it? When the consonant sounds preceding and following these vowels do not agree, the strike and grind, hat and man rhyme with each other according to the laws of assonance. Let us look at the next slide. Assonance is a literary device where the vowel sounds are repeated to create an internal rhyming within sentences or phrases. I have explained that. This is put more crisply, more precisely. To put it in simpler terms, it refers to the effect when a sound of vowel is repeated in a same sentence with the help of words that are positioned close to each other. This is important. I have positioned these words apart from each other, but they are next to each other, positioned close to each other, one following the other, different from Mantyanupras. I am repeating it again and again, because the moment you hear the word rhyme, what will come to your mind is Antyanupras. This is not Antyanupras. It does not come at the end of the line, but it comes continuously within the same line, within the same sentence. If it is poetry, right, it will go on. And therefore, if you have something like the deep sleep, right, means, deep sleep means, right, the consonants do not rhyme, but you have got deep sleep means, e, 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 this is assonance. Let us look at the next slide my dear students and I have got some examples for you. I must confess that in my quest, I felt depressed and restless. What is the assonance here? Look at fess in confess, quest, felt, pressed and restless. I will repeat that again, not pressed, but confess, s, fess, quest, felt and restless, eh, 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 if you get that. 
Look at the next one. Strips of tin foil winking like people. Strips, tin, wink. E, E, E. Do you get that, my dear students? It's in the middle of the word. But you can see that the same E. In the first one, it was E. Look at the third one. I call her a ghastly girl because she was a ghastly girl. And then we come on. A droopy, soupy. So you've got oo, oo. And then it goes on. Cooing voice. Okay? So you've got oo, oo, oo. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain. Uh, uh, uh. In this line, the sound of uh in purple and curtain is assonance. A little difficult, but not if you really, really repeat the words after me. If your teacher agrees, it would be a good idea to repeat only the words where the assonance takes place. So let's read the first sentence again. Confess, quest, felt, restless. Let's read the second one. Strips, tin, winking. Let's read the third one, only two words, uh, the fourth one, I'm sorry, curtain, purple, uh, uh, curtain, purple. Okay, so these are examples of assonance, my dear students. Can we go on and look at some more? A murmuring of innumerable bees, the E eh and the R. Or here, old Triton blow his wreathed horn, O, O, O. This is from Wordsworth. Here and then we go on. Here the mellow wedding bells. Eh, eh, eh. Right? Mellow wedding bells. You have to repeat in your mind or loudly only the vowel sound. So you repeat it and then you will realize what you mean by assonance. The next one that we have to talk about today, my dear students, is euphony. And what is euphony? Euphony is an agreeable sound. Euphony is an agreeable sound, especially in the phonetic quality of words. It comes from the French euphony or from Latin euphonia, from Greek euphony, which means sweet voiced, sweet voiced. The opposite of euphony is cacophony. You know, when there is a lot of noise and it is very irritating, we call it cacophony. But here, as a figure of speech, naturally, we are talking of euphony. You know, something that sounds lovely when you hear it, we call it euphony. It is an agreeable sound. Where does it? Remember, I talked to you about how these are related to the what we hear, assonance as well as euphony is talking about not meaning at all, but it is talking about sound. When we talked about in an earlier lecture and when you look at your other figures of speech, they all had something to do with meaning. But assonance and euphony have got something to do with the sound of the word. It comes from Latin, French, Greek, they all have the same word which means sweet sound, pleasing sound. A euphony is a pleasing sound. Look at your slide again, my dear students. And you have agreeableness of sound, pleasing effect, effect to the ear, a pleasant sounding or harmonious combination of succession of words, usually long vowels rather than consonants. And that is important. As I talked about in assonance, here also we are talking about sounds that vowels produce. Remember, not the vowel, uh, not the letters of the vowels, not A, E, I, O, U, but all the sounds that these vowels create, usually long vowels rather than consonants. Let me read one very beautiful example from Keats. And loosened syrup stinked with cinnamon, mana and dates in argosy transferred from fez. Again another, as when upon a trance to summer night, those green robed senators of mighty woods. He is actually talking about the trees and he calls them green robed senators of mighty woods. Examples of euphony. Because when you hear them, it is so pleasant. It is so pleasant to the ear. What have we looked at, my dear students? We have looked at four figures of speech. Metonymy and synecdoche. Difficult but not impossible to understand related to meaning, related to part and whole, container and contained, 
for if emphatic effect to create a picture in your mind's eye. We use the synecdoche and the metonymy. And the next two that I have talked about today, my dear students, assonance and euphony are figures of speech which are important because of the sound that they create. Remember, all poetry is meant to be read if you have to enjoy it. And when I say meant to be read, my dear students, read your poetry aloud, not to yourself, not silently, but when you read it aloud, even if it is to yourself, not in a classroom, not from a stage, not before a group, it would make great sense because it would give you so much more pleasure if you could have a feel for the sound of the language. And when you read your poetry now aloud, I am sure you will look back at this lecture and see whether the assonance and euphony comes across because is not it wonderful to be able to appreciate the sound of poetry as well as the meaning of poetry. This probably is your last lecture for this paper, paper number CC213, the paper that is called Literary Criticism. It began with critics and through critics, through our literary terms, we have reached the figures of speech. All the best for all your efforts in understanding this lecture and all the other lectures that you have been listening to all these days.